Hello, and welcome to Arabic Hour. My name is Amal Bashara. I teach anthropology at Tufts University, and it is a great pleasure to be here today with Professor Salim Tamari. Uh, we're going to have, I think, a wide-ranging conversation on, in some senses we've already begun today. Um, professor Salim Tamari is uh, Professor Emeritus at Birzeit University. He's a senior fellow at the Institute for Palestine Studies, and also he's editor of Jerusalem Quarterly. And we're very, very fortunate to have him in the area this year, or this semester, as the Shoah Visiting Professor at the Center for Middle East Studies at Harvard University. Um, he is, we're, we're able to celebrate a new book of his, as well as I just heard that there's another one soon on the way. Um, and he's the author of three recent books, um, the most recent of which is The Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, also The Year of the Locust, A Soldier's Diary, and The Erasure of Palestine's Ottoman Past, Mountain Against the Sea, Essays on Palestinian Society and Culture, as well as many, many articles um, over the years on such topics as the Palestinian intifadas, both of them, on the state of Palestinian um, social science, social sciences in Palestine, and um, so many other topics, really, uh, that we can't even count them. Uh, certainly a lot of scholarship, obviously, on Jerusalem as well. Um, so it's an honor to be with you today. Um, thank you. Thank you. So um, your work, in some ways, has focused on regional ideas of Palestine, on Jerusalem, but you also have written about Arab America. And I understand that, in one way or another, you are an Arab American as well. You've spent a lot of time here. Um, so I thought maybe we could just start today uh, by talking a little bit about a story from Mountain Against the Sea. Um, uh, you have a chapter entitled a Miserable Year in Brooklyn. Yes, <laughs> yes. Could you tell me a little bit about... Well, what's common in between the last three works in social history is biographical trajectories. I, I take, I use biography as a window to examine the social history and social dynamics of modern Palestinian society in the late Ottoman period and in the Mandate uh, era. So one of the stories in Mountain Against the Sea concerns the long trip taken by Khalil Sekakini, the well-known educator mm -hmm. to America in 1907-1908. He came in order to basically make some money to be able to marry his betrothed beloved Sultana, Sultana Abdo. And uh, he took a very arduous trip, which many uh, Middle Eastern Syrians, as they were known, from Mount Lebanon, from Syria, from mm -hmm. Palestine, Transjordan, used to come here. And a lot of them came to this area, to the Boston area, to work in textile factories and paper mills. And some went uh, to later to the car industries in mm. the Detroit area. But mm. in the earlier period, the turn of the century, they went to Sao Paulo. And and, and uh, Chile, they went mm -hmm. to Mexico, and then later came to North America. So Boston, as you know from the history of Gibran, Khalid Gibran, mm -hmm. uh, came to this area, and Sakakini came to New York. He was working for some time, 1907, in the um, uh, carpet selling, uh, um, uh, in, um, carpet sales, and as an itinerant laborer. Then he um. moved to Vermont and Maine, where he worked with paper mills. Mm. I have a very interesting photograph, the only one of him in America, where he was working in a factory in Rumford Falls, a tiny little town in Maine, paper wow. mill. So Khalil moves to Brooklyn, and he's writing letters to his beloved Sultana. I, I was lucky to get. 42 letters, love letters, that he wrote in one and a half year from Brooklyn to Sultana in Jerusalem. Incredible. And these letters are so moving because they first tell us something about what America was like for a, a, a poor working Arab mm -hmm. coming to make a living here. Mm -hmm. And second, about the expectations they had on the eve of the Constitutional Revolution of 1908, mm. with the Ottoman state moving towards 
um, um, individual rights, democratic rights, constitutional uh, changes. Mm -hmm. So that gave him a lot of hope about the uh, fall of despotism, of Abdul Hamid's despotism, and his mm -hmm. ability to go back after he would make some money. Had there been a doubt? Had he considered staying in the United States? Yeah. He, no, he, he was here to make money and go back and marry Sultana. But the living conditions were miserable. There was a, a, a minor uh, uh, depression uh, just before the First World War mm. in America. And the market was extremely difficult in t for itinerant laborers, uh, both in California and in the East Coast. So he began to work uh, as a night editor in a journal called Al Jamia, which is in Arabic. Now remember, in that period, at the turn of the century, most uh, Syrians, as they were called, would live in the Brooklyn area in one place called Atlantic Avenue, mm -hmm. which is still has traces of that. And Absolutely. Khalil commuted to Little Syria, which was on Washington Street in Manhattan, Lower mm -hmm. Manhattan, that same area where in the early 70s the World Trade Center was built. Right. And when they built the World Trade Center, they had to eradicate all of the offices and buildings that were constituted little Syria. Wow. So every day he would actually walk from Atlantic Avenue to Washington Street in little Syria and edit. Over the Brooklyn Bridge. Over the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm. When he was not selling carpets, he would be a, a night editor in Al Jamia working with a man called Farah Antoun, a, a Syrian Egyptian uh, editor. And that's how he made some money. Mm. But the money was very little, and he never actually made it. So he wrote these uh, letters, which I titled A Miserable Year in Brooklyn <laughs> to Sultana. And at the end, he decided he couldn't take it anymore. So he borrowed some money mm -hmm. and went back. Mm. And the letters are an expression of his longing to Sultana and to Jerusalem but mm. also about conditions of life for Arabs uh, in, in New York at the turn of the century. And were conditions for Arabs very different from those of other immigrants? Um. Uh, not, not much, actually, except that Arabs seem to have specialized in uh, working in uh, paper mills mm -hmm. uh, in the eastern coast, and later when they got some credit, they would sell carpets. Mm. Uh, itinerant laborers was a common um, task for poor Slavic, uh, South Mediterranean immigrants. Mm. But carpet sales seems to be a specialty of mm. Syrians and Arabs. And the carpets were coming from the Middle East? Or? The carpets were actually uh, industrial carpets. They were probably manufactured here in, oh. in this country. The other things they would sell is uh, trinkets from the Holy Land, uh -huh. uh, mother of pearls, wooden crosses, uh, you know, beads. The same beads probably that the the um, uh, American Indians were fooled by in Manhattan by the uh, by the um, settlers. Hmm. But uh, these were beads which were christened as holy beads. Oh, I see. And especially in South America, I mean. Selling holy trinkets was a very um, uh, important uh, job for immigrants to Mexico, Chile, Brazil, Honduras. Huh. And s some of it actually uh, mostly to Catholic uh, immigrants in the New World, in America. Mm -hmm. So, and the book as a whole, Mountain Against the Sea, is, is in some ways around these tensions around city, country, coast and the mountains. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the main themes of that? I'm especially interested because right now we're in a situation, of course, where Palestinians are so fragmented by different forms of legal rule, right? You know, that Israel rules over 48 Palestinians inside Israel in one way, and Palestinians in the West Bank in another, and another way in Gaza, and another way in Jerusalem. And of course, the refugees are fragmented by, by diaspora and being refugees as well, by the Nakba. Um, 
but you're writing about a time where there were different kinds of divisions and diversities um, that had very different reasons and textures and, and so forth. Can you tell me a little bit more about, um, about those themes? Well, it's, it's about social dynamics in Palestinian society uh, at the end of the Ottoman era, mm -hmm. beginning of the mandate, and it has a lot to do with um, urban, rural uh, nexus, uh, internal migration, external migration, the formation of urban culture, popular culture in the cities, uh, and uh, a lot of it is devoted to uh, ceremonial space, what mm. I call, uh, uh, in Arabic, uh, they, they call it maqamat, uh, mm -hmm. which is the saints and shrines holidays, mm -hmm. which are celebrated all over Palestine and Syria, but especially in the Holy Land, mm. uh, where uh, villages would seek um, annual celebrations like uh, Nabi Musa and Nabi Rubin. Mm. St. George was very big in mm. Palestine. Uh, in fact, we know that St. George was the main saint of the country. Wow. So much so that he was buried 42 times in 42 shrines. The main one, of course, is uh, Al Khadr, as the Arabic name for St. George is near Bethlehem. Yes, a, vil a village now. I, it's a whole village which has the shrine of St. George, mm -hmm. Khadr. And usually peasants and urban people go there seeking cures from mental illness. St. George mm. is the saint of the insane. Mm. So people take people who are uh, suffering from mental issues and seek salvation for them uh, intercession is, is the right word with St. George. But the main uh, ceremonies were those of Nabi Musa, which is Moses. Mm -hmm. In the Islamic tradition, Moses is buried not in Mount Nebo, but in Jericho. Ah. And people go to his shrine in the spring ah. and celebrate his holiday. And Nabi Rubin, Reuven, whose shrine is south of Jaffa, and that's a one month long uh, social uh, activities in August, where people s see, take a break from the humdrum of daily life and celebrate uh, his birthday. Mm -hmm. But there are thousands of minor sheikhs and sheikhat, some of them are women mm -hmm. saints, whose intercession is used for various ailments, barren women who want to become fertile, mm -hmm. they seek intercession with them. And these ceremonials were very important as a, a, a dictating the rhythm of, of the seasonal and um, um, annual cycle mm. uh, in Palestine, but particularly the agricultural cycle. Oh, interesting. So like the harvest, the um, the planting season, the threshing season, mm. are interspersed with these intercessional activities w with the saints known as maqamat. Uh -huh. And you've also written about sort of the creation of a new kind of a secular publicity, a new, you know, secular, yes. secular space and publicity. How does that intersect with this calendar of festivals? Well, uh, if you read the works of Tawfiq An'an, who mm -hmm. is a very important ethnographer, mm. who lived uh, at the turn of the century and was an officer in the Ottoman army, he wrote a lot about urban ethnography. Mm -hmm. And that links what I have been saying about the celebration of saints' lives and saints' holidays with urban ethnography, which sometime after the First World War, began to secularize religious space. And mm -hmm. what happened is that uh, a lot of these ceremonials were syncretic in religious terms, as mm. the anthropologists would say, mm -hmm. meaning that Muslims, Jews, and Christians shared the celebration of saints who were ostensibly Muslim, uh -huh. or ostensibly Christian, or acceptably Jewish, mm -hmm. such as Reuven. Mm. or Shimon HaSiddiq in Jerusalem. Mm. But in popular practices, sometimes with the chagrin of rabbis and sheikhs and priests, would jointly celebrate these holidays. Mm. And over time, 
some of these celebrations, such as the celebrations of the Virgin, Virgin's birthday on August 15th in Sheikh Jarrah, became secular holidays of um, uh, s spring celebration, mm. very similar to what uh, the Thanksgiving holidays in America, huh. which had different roots, but was uh, subverted, if you like, mm. with uh, urban population turning them into uh, public holidays and uh, jointly s celebrating them. Your work is incredible because it's able; it, it lets us see places in such new light. You know, like Sheikh Jarrah and like uh, Al Khadr Village in Bethlehem. Like it, it's you, you really bring the history forward to people who, you know, aren't aware of these, you know, histories of festivals and so forth that that, that are that are present. Um, yes, but it's such uh, a broadening of perspective. I mean, not to contradict what you said, um, we also have to be cognizant, not to idealize these yeah. events, because by the 1930s and because of Zionism. Mm -hmm because of Jewish nationalist claims over the land and their collusion with British colonialists, religion became nationalized. Right. And many of these ceremoni ceremonials, which used to be shared by all religious communities, all of a sudden became nationalist celebrations uh, in which they contested uh, territorial claims mm -hmm. and uh, claims uh, and defensive uh, claims for the land against the intrusion of uh, the Zionist movement, which, according to the Balfour Declaration by Britain, began to make claims over the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that your work does a great job of not romanticizing things. I mean, throughout, you know, when you write about contemporary Palestinian life as well as when you write about the past, I think this is, you make things lively and interesting and rich without romanticizing or, or coming at it from a, a nationalist perspective that would reduce the complexity of all of these stories. It seems like that's another thread that runs through all of your work. Um, I wanted to ask you about the great, speaking of, in some senses, nationalism. Uh, so your new book, um, The Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, um, is one of the chapters in it deals with the idea of Palestine and the place of Palestine in the Ottoman Empire and how it was or wasn't seen as a unit separate from the rest of Syria and how it was defined and, you know, which was somewhat different in this period, it sounds like, than in earlier periods. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm, of course, especially interested because I am from the Akka area, and Akka is part of, is, plays a role in this story, it seems like. Yeah, well, we're not far from each other. I was born in Jaffa, uh -huh. and I have a huge interest. I was a baby when the War of 48 happened, but my part of my family remained in Jaffa, and... Mm. A lot of my work concerns about this, uh, which you refer to as the coastal mountain dichotomies. Mm -hmm. People who were exiled uh, to the inland mm -hmm. part of Palestine, outside Palestine, developed a different social dynamics. And of course, those who remained inside, mostly in the Galilee, were separated and develop different cultural trajectories. Mm -hmm. the, the third book that you refer to is called Remaking the Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, uh, concerns this rupture of Palestine from Syria mm -hmm. in the post-Ottoman settlement. And in it, I examine possibilities of what could have happened had the war did not take place counterfactual history of sorts, and the relationship of the Syrian provinces, including Palestine, to Anatolia, mm -hmm. and the fate of the movement known as Osmanilik, which is the constitutional Ottoman movement that celebrated a decentralized imperial domain in which the Arab provinces, the Anatolian provinces, the Kurdish areas, uh, would have autonomy in articulating their own national cultures, use of their languages mm -hmm. in schools and courts, etc., while remaining as part of a great Middle Eastern multinational, multi ethnic mm -hmm. empire. Mm -hmm. Of course, that did not happen, it collapsed, and with that collapse, we have the emergence of new tra trajectories. Mm -hmm. And I discuss uh, uh, six characters, six, um, including a very important 
women uh, from Jaffa by the name of Adele Azar uh -huh. who wrote a diary and who is totally, I could say, almost totally unknown. Hmm. And she... She was uh, involved with education and charity, yeah. Yeah, she was involved with refugee, uh, ref the refugees coming from the First World War and mm. establishing girls' schools for refugee girls. And in it, I examine what I call uh, crypto-feminism uh -huh. or the roots of feminism in the early charitable work taking care of refugees after the First World War. Mm -hmm. And I derived from her writings um, the kinds of debates that were going on at the same time mm. uh, to, to see w what happened with what became known as the Arab Women's Movement mm. in the 1930s and 40s and then after the war. And um, how do you usually, are these papers that were archived somewhere or you, you reach them through family archives? of her family or how did you? Some of them are available from national archives, but most of them are what I call family papers. Mm -hmm. in, in my uh, institute, mm -hmm. we encourage families to deposit their uh, f family papers, wow. whether they are diaries, correspondence, what seems to be mundane to most people, but for us very important sources mm -hmm. for social history. We, we scan them, we classify them, and then we make them available to researchers. This is such a rich, important resource. Yes, and of course, you know that Palestine did not have a national archive because of the fate of the Palestinians after 48. Mm -hmm. And oral history and family papers became crucial alternate ways of looking at that rich history. Mm -hmm. Uh, before 48 and after 48, including uh, uh, oral uh, recordings of narratives of war, but also of life before the war. Mm. So that's a rich source that has becoming of enhanced importance to write the social history of Palestine, given the absence of, um, or, or the fact that the actual paper archives is either colonial in the British or French um, um, national archives or Israeli mm -hmm. uh, which appropriated all the uh, papers uh, and intelligence reports that um, were undertaken th and until today. So uh, it's an alternate history which some people call subaltern history mm -hmm. but it's if the idea is to give voice to the voiceless. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly r important. Do you ever work with the Israeli State Archives? Yes, or I do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of my sources, actually, for the second book that you referred to is mm -hmm. called um, uh, The Year of the Locust. Mm -hmm. It's a diary of a Jerusalem soldier who, which found its way to the Israeli National Archives. And that diary is very precious, in my view, because mm. it was written by a young man in the years 1915, 1916, 1917, mm. and he was shot to death during the First World War. Mm. And we have a spontaneous, intimate diary of his inner thoughts, but it's also a great um, manifest of, of the quotidien, of daily life mm. in Jerusalem and Palestine during the war years, which included the, the locust attack, the famine years, mm. the conscription, uh, what is known as Sefer Berlik, which is the, the Turkish word for conscription and sending young men uh, to the fronts in Gallipoli and uh, Bir Sabah and Suez and Kutl Amar in southern Iraq. So mm -hmm. virtually half of them died in that yeah. war. Palestine experienced not Palestine only, but Syria and Anatolia. One sixth of the population perished in that war. The highest rate in the world. Wow. In, in proportional terms, of, in terms of the population, perished um, because of the war casualty, but also untreated wounds. There were no penicillin mm. and the diseases, mm -hmm. cholera and typhus being the main disease in that period. Mm. So that, that, diary was 
uh, found in the Israeli National Archive. I was founded. I deciphered it. Part of mm. it was written in code. And uh, wow. you may want to, to know what he was writing code because yeah. we suspected he was uh, writing secret hostile thoughts towards Jamal Pasha and the, and the Turkish leadership. It turned out that he was in love with his professor's wife. Uh -oh. And that wife was none other than Sultana, who the appears wife. in uh, the love letters from Khalil to Sultana in, in the Brooklyn years. Interesting. The same woman, uh, she wasn't of great beauty, but I mean, we, we have images of her, but the young man, Ihsan, was infatuated with her and used to do shopping for her at the behest of his, uh, of, of, of his teacher, Khalil. And he was a foot soldier at the same time, stationed in Jerusalem. So he'd take the groceries and just express his uh, great affection for this lady, very innocent. But he wrote it in code in case hmm. somebody might uh, read the, the diary. How and did you decode the code? It was decoded by a, f a friend of mine who's a poet who was oh. able to see repetitive use. It was very simple code. Okay. We tried to use it in the computer but didn't work. Hmm. But my um, dear friend Zakaria Muhammad, the poet, was able to crack the code and we found that Sultana's name kept repeating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> and then you're able from her name to get the rest of the code? And yeah. Incredible. Right, yeah. And did you ever have her papers? Have you been able to work with her papers we or her writing? We have one letter from Sultana to Khalil uh -huh. in which she told him uh, basically to forget about moaning and whining about her and get his act together, either come back and marry her because mm. they were engaged. I see. Or if he wants to stay in America, she will find alternatives. It was a very harsh and uh, threatening letter. Wow. That I think it, it, it sent him into panic because <laughs> uh, immediately after that mm, uh, letter was re received, he began to look for money to purchase to a back. ticket. Very expensive in those days. Mm. I mean, they were um, traveling on, on, on the deck, third class, but still very expensive mm. uh, to go back uh, via Marseille mm. to Jaffa. And Jerusalem. Mm, interesting. And that's what he did. Hmm. Um, so you never, but you didn't hear about her response to the soldiers? No, <laughs> nothing we, on that. We actually, it's not clear whether she was aware of the uh. sentiments of the soldier. It was like a silent love. Ah, uh, I see. Uh, I don't think he articulated it except in his, uh, you know, repressed uh, coded messages. Wow. Um, and how did, it, how did that diary fall into the Israeli State Archives? Well, he hid the diary with, uh, with his, in his mother's bedroom in, in, in the old city. Uh -huh. He was killed in early December uh, 1917 by the commanding officer uh, uh, under conditions that I describe in my book. So mm -hmm. you have to read it mm -hmm. if you want to know more. And the family moved to the new city in the area of Musrara, in the house of his. And Adil uh, had all the family papers there. And it's not clear whether the fa because I later met the grandchildren mm. and they were not aware of this diary. Mm. So the Israelis just took everything and they, as they did with much of the looted material, they sent it to the National Archives and it was listed there under the uh, classification AP, which means absentee property. And that's how I found it in, in, the, in the Israeli National Archives. Mm. I uh, purchased a, a scanned copy and I edited it. Mm. So this speaks to, again, why it's so very important that the Institute for Palestine Studies is able to create an archive today 
of Palestinian Absolutely, papers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. we know what the alternative is in some senses, or what you know, at least what the alternative was in '48. Yeah. Um, so I'm also really interested in how you've been able to write about ethnographers um, across some of these books. Um, in particular, uh, The Great War and Mountain Against the Sea. Um, and you obviously are an anthropologist. I, I know that you your I'm PhD is in sociology, but yeah. but I've always thought of you also as an anthropologist. I'm, I'm an honorary anthropologist. Yes. In your <laughs> eyes only. <laughs> Not only in my <laughs> eyes, I don't think. Um, but, um, I mean, yeah, so I would just love to hear, um, were these people figures that you had al always known about and were always interested in learning more about? Um, did you discover them along the way through this research? Um, also, I mean, I think that they are, they're doing obviously different kinds of work than you've done, and yet, um, you know, there are similarities and you know, there are ways in which your works cross, cross paths. So, um, can you tell me a little bit about um, writing about these other ethnographers and well, social scientists? The one of the m most important ethnographers was a medical doctor by the name of Tawfiq Kanan that yeah. I mentioned earlier. And he was a medical doctor who has major interest in peasant lore. Mm -hmm. And he used to treat peasants in return for not phys uh, material payment, but for talismans. They would give him items of uh, ethnographic interest. Wow magic balls, um, uh, hijabs, which, what, what's the uh, English term for hijab? It's what you hang in your neck to like protect Like the amulet. You. Amulet, yeah. yes, the amulets, uh, and so on. So he collected a huge mm. um, collection of amulets and talismans and wrote about them. He, mm -hmm. he uh, um, and the, the collection of Angular is now in the Berzet University Museum. Mm. You, can, you can reach it there. But his ethnographic material is very rich, mm -hmm. which I examine in the second volume that we talked about. In the third volume, mm. we look at the ethnographic work of two important uh, Syrians and Palestinians. One is uh, Hamad Bahjat from Aleppo, mm -hmm. and the other is Rafiq Tamimi from Nablus. They both wrote a, a huge two-volume monograph called Wilayat Beirut. Almost like a, an almanac. It's like an sort. almanac. It's like a salname, which was commissioned by the uh, Ottoman authorities. Uh -huh. About it is exactly an almanac mm -hmm. actually, but it's richly ethnographic because both of them actually studied ethnography and sociology in in Paris. Mm -hmm. And there were Ottoman officers at the same time, so mm. we were commissioned to do this work. And Tamimi, who is from Nablus, wrote another volume, which I discuss in my work, called Philistine Risalacy, mm -hmm. which is a Turkish document used as a manual for Ottoman officers during the war. It's an ethnographic survey of Palestine, which includes also like a military handbook, roads and rivers and uh, telegraphic poles and so on. But what village and urban um, um, society looked like. Mm. And the, although he did not sign his name on this book, he actually, you can, I did a, a textual analysis. I mm. found that the writer of Philistine Risalacy is the same writer who wrote Bulat Beirut. Right, yes, I remember seeing and it, And yeah. the two overlapped, and I, I do, I, I'm speculating, I may be wrong, that the author of this Palestine Treatise is the same author as, as, uh, uh, as Bahjat and Tamimi. So the material is very rich because it tells us a lot about uh, quotidian daily life in uh, urban centers in uh, northern Palestine mm. in that period, including um, habitat, uh, uh, urban architecture, and details like consumption patterns mm. in different kinds of families, uh, religious practices, even to the point of describing the kind of furniture and uh, eating utensils people use. It's a great source of ethnographic knowledge uh, from the First World War period. It's incredible. And, and you compare it 
a little bit to the sort of equivalent types of writing by British officers. And you point out that these are much more culturally rich. I, I mean, I, I guess I couldn't help wondering, though, I mean, do you put this, these almanacs in a context of a kind of a colonial ethnography, I understand that some of them, that, that you know, that in particular the author who's from Nablusi is Palestinian, but I mean they are writing it for, you know, the Ottomans. So I mean, how do you situate this as uh, what kind of ethnography is this in well, some senses? Well, th these were commissioned reports, so yeah. they they were highly categorical, uh, taxonomized, and so on. Mm. But you can tell that the writers are not any military officers mm. writing uh, an almanac. They are actually, uh, they have a training in social science, they have an eye for uh, the, the social details mm. of daily life, and maybe it overwhelmed their own writings mm. in that direction. So we're very lucky to have them. They're very different from, um, I mean, they have the same contours as French and British military manuals, but uh, they are different in the in these uh, highly nuanced ethnographic details that's not found in the European manuals. So these are really important, rich sources. Yeah, and you also write about photography in this book um, about uh, a photographer who is um, Khalil Rad. Khalil Rad. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, who you talk about? There's sort of only a, a very specific knowledge of his work. Um, being really serving of the Ottomans, and yet you write about a much richer, available work of his. No, now I know that Is you that read right? the book. <laughs> 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 and protest pictures, which I would love to see. <laughs> he had protest pictures, yes, yeah? Yes. And a picture of a, a hanging, and I mean, this is really. Yeah. Khalil really Rad rich. Was, uh, was very. He lived to be 100 years old. Wow. And he started taking photographs uh, for sale in the 1870s in, in glass negatives. In the 1870s? In the 1870s. He was trained by an Armenian uh, photographer called uh -huh. Karabidian. He's the founder of Palestinian photography yes. from the Ar Armenian Patriarchate. And the later, he, his daughter married the son of Karabidian. Mm. So they sort of, they were competitors, but they became partners in older age. And he became a commissioned photographer for the Ottoman army. He became very close to Jamal Pasha. And I deal with uh, his propaganda uh, photography for the army during the First World War. Uh, but he was a very sensitive photographer. Mm. So you see, for example, um, a lot of the cruelty of the war manifested in, in his photographic uh, selection, including the hanging of deserters and so on. So, kind of like the writers of the Almanac, they were in a complex position where they were writing or working for the Ottomans, and yet they had a very specific local perspective on, on what they were doing also. Khalil Rad was arrested by the, uh, by the British Army mm. because he had studios on Jaffa Street, and he was basically a portrait photographer mm. in, uh, after the war and before the war. And he was arrested for his work with the Ottoman army. And they took a huge stock of that. That's how I found. The, uh, and they were um, confiscated and deposited later in Oxford University at St. Anthony's College. Mm. I found a lot of these um, um, photographs there, which he had, of course, by then tried to hide or suppress. But uh, it was deposited there, and that's how we found them. Mm -hmm. But Khalil Rad is much more important than just um, a war photographer. He, he is a great uh, landscape photographer. Mm -hmm. He has scenes from daily life. Mm -hmm. He lived all the way to the uh, 1950s, Incredible, continued yeah. to photograph. He was 98 or 99, and he was still photographing at the end of his life. Wow. Do we want to? Uh, I think it would be great, and I know people would enjoy hearing or appreciate hearing uh, a bit of your thoughts on the current situation in Jerusalem before we go. Um, were you in Jerusalem in the fall when yeah. Trump made his announcement yeah. about the moving I, of the embassy? Um, I live in the Jerusalem area. I live in the city of Ramallah, 
and um, the issue of Jerusalem is politically crucial for us, but also sentimentally and uh, in terms of scholarship, because mm -hmm. my own work is to edit a journal mm -hmm. called the Jerusalem Quarterly about the history, past and future of the city. So we were rather apprehensive about the intentions of the, of the Trump administration mm -hmm. on Jerusalem, especially when it was compounded with the heralded um, deal of the century. Um, uh, what's it called in English? It's the uh, it's not in Arabic. It's called Safqat al Qarn, which means deal of the century. Mm, mm, mm. In English, it's called something else. Um, the decisive deal or mm. the ultimate, the ultimate, ultimate. Deal. Sorry, yeah. The ultimate deal. So there was heralding of this, and we knew that uh, the Trump administration was very much influenced with the extreme uh, wings of the Israeli government in formulating a certain vision to the Middle East. But it was a total surprise, m maybe not for some, but to either prelude that announcement of the deal with the decision to move the American embassy to Jerusalem, mm. which had been on in the books for the last four or five American administrations under immense pressure from both the Zionist lobby and from the Congress. Mm. Now, the embassy issue is very interesting because if you remember from the period of the Clinton administration, it was heralded as an impending move and all successive American presidents, mm -hmm. including um, President Bush Sr. and George W. Bush, had postponed that, basically suspended it, uh, by um, vetoing mm. the congressional move. Mm -hmm. And the issue became very uh, volatile because the designated area for the embassy in Jerusalem was the Arambi barracks uh, from the uh, mandate uh, area, which was land owned by six Jerusalem Arab families. Mm. And these families took the Israelis to court for donating their own confiscated land to the Americans. So that sort of sabotaged in a way, undermined and circumvented the ability of the Israelis to offer that land to the Americans. Mm. And against this background was the new move by uh, President Trump to move the embassy to Jerusalem. So, um, but that's a technical issue. The main issue, of course, is that Jerusalem is claimed by the Palestinians as their future capital and the Israelis already claim it as their capital. Mm -hmm. So in the protracted negotiations that took place in Taba and before that in Camp David and before that in, in um, Oslo, the idea was to create two capitals for two future states. Mm -hmm. This was the peace formula that uh, had been worked out over the last three decades since the Madrid Peace Conference. And for Mr. Trump to preempt the, that negotiating process, what is known as the peace process, which is now in shambles after the failure of the Oslo Accords, uh, mean to undermine not only the peace process, the possibility of concord between the Israelis and Palestinians, and to undermine the possibility of the creation of a Palestinian state as a, a territorial solution for the Palestine problem, mm -hmm. but undermines his own vision of reaching concord between the Palestinians and mm. the Israelis. So it's not clear why he made it, what sort of <laughs> pressures were, were he was, one can speculate on. But that's the kind of dead end that uh, we have reached in this episode.
And, 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 and with more to come, it sounds like, since there is, he's planning to do it officially to open up a new embassy by, by Nakba Day, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's especially mm -hmm. dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I'm so grateful to have had the chance to talk with you about your work and, um, and also about these contemporary issues. Um, and I hope this won't be the last time that you're on Arabic Hour with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you next time on Arabic Hour.